let's talk about the next scenario. So you've got a 44 year female brought in by the father, okay, uh, with abdo pain. Uh, sorry, I should have written husband. I don't know why I wrote father. So she's nauseous, looks uh, pale, dehydrated, denies any fever, loose tools, uh, substance intake, overdose, has generalized abdo pain with no guarding tenderness. Uh, her vital signs are, sorry, that's another mistake. Uh, vital signs look to be a little unstable. If you see the blood pressure is 82 upon 62, pulse rate is definitely going high, the respiratory rate is high, and oxygen sats still okay. What do you think? So whenever you think about a female patient, think about ectopic, not only ectopic, but ectopic. So the patient, whether maybe having uh, asked about the last menstrual period, we never ask, ask about their LMP, ask about their cystic disease, whether you're suspecting a ovarian rupture or anything, ask, think about torsion of ovary. It could be a simple ovulation issue. Uh, they may be having a pelvic inflammatory disease. Also think about pyelonephritis or kidney stones, for instance, uh, whether they're having an incomplete abortion or they're having cystitis. Main concept always, always ask for LMPs, okay? Uh, if the patient, uh, like it's a very, very gray zone in India, you know, still whether you can do a urine dipstick or for a pregnancy test, if they're not married, I'm not gonna go into the gray zone basically, but in the UK, every patient goes for a urine dip basically. Every female, they do a urine dip despite they tell us, they don't tell us. But my, I, I'm not recommending that to be done. Uh, I'll tell my own uh, stuff. Uh, I did, uh, you know, have some scenarios where you, you know, the patient are not giving you a good history. They're not a good historian. They're giving you dicey stuff and everything. But if you do a urine dip, it came positive for ectopic one of the times. So yes, I'm not recommending that. Always take consent of the patient or their relatives or the husband or, you know, the patient is a minor about the, like from the parents. If not, you know, think about basically having an ectopic. That's what I'm saying. So when we send labs of this patient, this is what you get. The hemoglobin has not dropped, whoops, but the counts are high, okay? Blood sugar, serum glucose level is 400, jeez. And uh, other than that, if you come to the pH, you can see that the pH is 7.15, okay? So initially, all of us were thinking whether this patient is having a ectopic, or this patient may be having an acute abdomen, maybe appendicitis, which has burst or something, something, something. But this patient is presenting in with something which is more deadly, and it is DKA. So uh, the reason I'm telling you this, whenever you're having high lactates, high ketones, acidosis, and the patient does not have any obvious uh, history of DM, check BM, blood sugars, that's what I'm saying. If your blood sugars are high, do a urine dip, urine dip. You can see glucose and ketones, everything. So what are the causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis? Because DK is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis, isn't it? So how do you calculate anion gap? Sodium minus chloride plus bicarb. So, okay, you calculate your uh, anion gap. What could cause high levels of these? So uh, there's a mnemonic to it. It's called ACAT mud pile. So if the patient is having aspirin overdose, carbon monoxide poisoning, cyanide poisoning, uh, paracetamol poisoning, theophylline and toxicity, uh, methanol ingestion, high metformin, uh, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, propanyl glycol, not very much used in India, isoniazide, uh, iron toxicity, uh, lactic acidosis, and ethylene glycol. So if you have any overdose. See, the good thing about India, uh, you know, Indian patients is we don't see these type of atypical poisoning cases. We would see uh, organophosphates and all, but usually we don't see. Uh, in the UK, we see all these. To be honest, like, uh, poisonings and overdose from stuff that you would have never thought about and you get them. Paracetamol is one of the most commonest one that we see, along with ethylene glycol as well. So yes, it depends on country to country, but how do you treat this patient? So uh, I've taken this from the East Italy, uh, Midlands uh, ED department, basically. So whenever you are suspecting a DKA, what are your basic aim? You'll have to replenish the fluid. The patient may be five to eight liters, 10 liters deficit, basically. So get wide IV bowline lines. Um, if possible, get the arterial line because you'll need the arterial or the venous gas every hour. 
so uh, make sure that you start the patient with IV fluids. Make sure you start them on the insulin. Uh, there's a slight difference here. Uh, like uh, some people prefer subcut initially followed by IV infusions. A few would go for direct IV infusions. Uh, but if you go with the basic guidelines, like in Oxford Handbook, you just need to give IV. Okay. So fluids uh, along with IV insulin, make sure you're taking care of the potassium because insulin will cause hypokalemia. So uh, once you start all these treatments, shift the patient to the ICUs, uh, keep a constant monitoring on the patients because uh, the complications of DK are very, very dreadful and they'll cause from death in patients. And then if not treated in the initial hour as well, if not recognized initial hour as well, it will all come back to you. One more thing I would request uh, you all uh, is whenever you're treating DK, make sure you document everything in their notes. If not possible, after one hour or something, just document something that you've seen the patient, overviewed the patient. Because what happens is, I know we all are busy in the ED, but you know, uh, for like for instance, this patient might would have developed some complication, and we'd not take a look of it. And you know, the ITU people find it, it it's not a pleasant sight basically because the patient may become critically unwell or die because of you. So I hope these sort of clinical scenarios would be have been helpful to you. Uh, I think I'm really, really short of time. Okay, so the main conclusive point of this uh, webinar is always approach with A, B, C, D, E. Treat the complexities then and there. For instance, if the airway is compromised, get the circulatory lines, intubate the patient. If the breathing is not well, if the patient is asthmatic, COPD, you can hear, you know, patient wheezy, nebulize the patient, give steroids to the patient. If the patient is in shock, give IV fluids, arrange for bloods, whatnot. If the patient is not neurologically fine, think about stroke, think about hypoglycemia. Exposure, the reason for exposure, for instance, or you've got a trauma patient, you didn't expose the patient well, and the patient has got, for some, like, uh, you may say, a pelvic fracture. There you go. Pelvic fracture is going to lose around 2 to 2.5 liters of blood. You did not see it well. You missed it and the patient dies. Okay. Always expose the patient, but make sure that you're not giving a hypothermia to the patient. Make sure you're covering them. Make sure you take a consent from them uh, because in the UK, as I say, exposing the patients takes priority because you're still trying to save the life of the patient. But in India, we still have so many complexities regarding you know, uh, privacy of the patient and everything. Don't expose them in front of 10 people. Make sure you maintaining their privacy, their dignity and everything. But also, if possible, take a consent from them and then only expose them. Uh, in the disability part, if you can see on the right, uh, do a neurological, focus neurological assessment and do a rectal examination if possible. Uh, in the UK, we also see a lot of quad equina syndrome, which for some reason we never saw in India. So yes, rectal examination is also a very, very important part for, uh, you know, making a differential diagnostics between various diseases. So uh, I think that is all from my end for today. Uh, thank you so much. Any questions or queries, you can start asking now. Uh, the references that I basically use was ACLS guidelines and Oxford Handbook of Emergency Medicine. And I also run a vlog on YouTube. It's called UK Dreamers for guys who want to plan to come to the UK and start working here. So there you go. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you.